thank the organizers again for the opportunity to present the work that we do. Um, previously at Scripps Research and coming this summer, we'll be at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology. So my work focuses on glycoproteins and the loss of glycoprotein in particular. Although we do study a variety of viruses in the Sapphire Lab, primarily the filoviruses, which um, I'm sure you all are aware of, and I, I'm the head of the arenavirus group. So the arenaviruses comprise viruses such as Lassa, LCMV, Lujo, amongst others. Filoviruses are 40 to 90 percent lethal. The arenaviruses can have up to 70 percent lethality. But what really, really fascinates us about these viruses is they're extremely simple. While humans have 20,000 genes, these viruses have just a few tools in their toolbox. Ebola has seven genes, and Lassa has just four. And what our lab seeks to do is to use structural biology, uh, X-ray crystallography, as well as cryo-EM, to understand what are these machines, what do they look like, and most importantly, how can we defeat them? So from these four or seven genes, these viruses can cause massive outbreaks for Ebola. For Lassa, it's actually endemic. So every single year, hundreds of thousands of people are infected with Lassa in Western Africa. The arenaviruses as a whole are found worldwide. There's Hunin virus, Machupo virus, Guanarito virus, Sabia virus, Whitewater Arroyo virus. These are all pathogenic viruses in the New World group. They're found in the New World and in South America primarily. Lujo virus had, has just one outbreak, but it was 80% lethal. LCMV is the darling of immunology. It's found worldwide, um, but can also be lethal to transplant patients. It's immuno, it causes immunocompromisation as well as birth defects in pregnant women. The virus I study is called Lassa. It's endemic in Western Africa, as I mentioned, and these arenaviruses express just one single protein on their cell surface. It's called GPC, and as the only thing on the viral surface, it's a major target for vaccine design. However, 50 years of Lassa vaccine studies basically created a dogma that it's T cells that drive protection and antibodies don't neutralize Lassa. But we wondered, is that really true or had we just not found the right ones? The GPC is arranged like this. It's got a receptor binding subunit and a membrane fusion subunit. It's cleaved, the single peptide is cleaved while it is actually maintained with the, with the remainder of the glycoprotein that stays embedded in the membrane. There's a protease called S1P that cuts the GP1 and the GP2 subunit from one another. This single subunit forms a trimer on the viral surface, and after entry into the cell, it, when it uh, reaches low pH endosomes, the GP1 subunit is released, and that GP2 subunit is rearranged into a post six helix post-fusion bundle. Now these individual subunits, they're very stable, and they're easy to make an image. However, the trimer itself, the pre-fusion form, is unstable, and it's very difficult to make an image. This is evident by the number of structures that are available for each one of these different subunits alone. So we have lots of stru structures of each thing alone, and a low angstrom, uh, low resolution structure of the trimer from viral particles. But up until just a few years ago, no high resolution structure of this GP trimer existed. So after 10 years of working on this problem, we solved it. And we did so by working here. We have laboratories in Sierra Leone. We travel into Freetown and drive about six hours on dirt roads to a place called Kenema. Kenema is the site of the Kenema Government Hospital, which up until a few years ago, again, had the only ward dedicated to the treatment of hemorrhagic fever. We're really fortunate that next to this loss of ward, there's a laboratory. So you have the LASA ward where you can collect patient samples, take them directly over to the LASA lab next door. We have outreach that goes out to these remote villages. Those folks do rodent sampling to assess the prevalence of the virus in its natural host. We consent and sero survey people to collect samples directly from those who were most affected. They do rodent surveying. The rodents uh, burrow into the homes. 
which then causes aerosolation in their food stores. They help the locals set traps. And then as night falls, the outreach team gathers the village in their main square, and through songs and movies, they talk about Lhasa and educate the people affected by this virus on how they can protect themselves. So this project was successful because of this fantastic synergy between the long-term relationships we have with people on the ground in this endemic area and our work at Scripps. So we worked lockstep engineering prefusion GP trying to find antibodies in Africa going back and forth. And a few insights came out of this work. The first was that neutralizing antibodies do exist against Lhasa. These were the first panel of human antibodies ever discovered. And not only do they exist, but we found that the very best antibodies bind that unstable, difficult to image protein. They don't bind to the individual subunits or the subunits that are sort of more open. The second insight was this, is not only do neutralizing antibodies exist, they are life-saving. And they're life-saving even when you give them to animals that were going to die the next day. And you can do so at low dose. But you have to have a certain glycoprotein structure to elicit these types of antibodies. And that was the third insight, is what exactly is this structure? The last virus glycoprotein looks like this. It's almost uh, like a, an ice cream cone. So here I've colored the GP1 receptor binding subunits in light colors and the GP2 subunit in the dark colors. If you look from the top, you can see that one arm of one GP1 subunit reaches out and around and it grabs onto the monomer of the other. Now from the top, these termini look quite close together, but in fact, they're about 30 angstroms apart, and I'll show you that in a minute. If we color this now in slightly different colors where the GP1 subunits are dark blue, the GP2 is in light blue, I want you to focus on that yellow subunit there. When we do this, we realize that loss of virus glycoprotein is unique amongst the other viruses in this class. So when you look at flu, HIV, or Ebola, you can notice that that yellow helical bundle there is the same exact one here. This was a surprise to us. We assumed that we would get the same kind of domain, domain structure in each of these. Now, the other thing is this cleavage event. This was something that caused a lot of consternation for us early on, is that you have to have 100% of your molecules cleaved in order to form this trimeric structure. So if we color it now based on the, the GP2 subunit and its various different components, we can track how this GP2 affects its conformational changes to drive the virus into the cell. So once it hits low pH, that fusion peptide reaches out and up and it plunges itself into that host cell membrane, which causes a complete rearrangement of that yellow subunit. It completely straightens itself out. The green helix comes around and packs itself against the, against the, uh, the yellow subunit, making this three helix bundle, six helix bundle and driving the membranes together. Now, we knew this was going to happen. These structures had been published. It was um, known from the type of glycoprotein. We expected this. However, it turns out there's also a structural change in GP1. The, subunit, the GP1 subunit was solved in isolation uh, a few years back as well, and it, the crystals formed in pH 5. And when we look at how this structure looks like as compared to our GP1 subunit in the context of the post-prefusion trimer, we can see that there's several conformational changes. The, the termini here are in completely different locations. Things that are disordered or alpha helical in the prefusion structure become beta sheets in the post-fusion structures. Alpha helices that are apart and facing one direction become single helices and change direction in the other. This was a surprise to us. And what we find is that it's this primed GP1 that's required to bind to an endosomal receptor called LAMP1. And what this also means is if you're starting out in the prefusion complex and once you have the GP1 released and it changes structure, if you go looking for antibodies with the wrong bait, you're gonna pick up the wrong fish. Using the wrong shape will find the wrong antibodies all the time. 
So these are unique to Lassa virus and its close cousins. There's also structures of the Machupa virus, GP1 solved in isolation, Hunin virus, GP1, and Whitewater Arroyo virus, GP1, and they all look pretty much the same. And when you take that and you compare it to Lassa, the termini are in the same location and the helices are in the same location. There's no conformational changes in the New World viruses. So is this related to their receptor use? Lassa uses a very specialized sugar called matriglycan, which exists on alpha glycan to enter cells. And we know that the GP1 subunit is insufficient for receptor binding. What we do know is every single residue that has been mapped for high, re high affinity receptor binding lies at the trimeric interface. The trimer is what is required to bind to this receptor. And then once it does that, it switches with just the GP1 subunit alone inside the cell. This is different for pathogenic arenaviruses, which, which use transferrin-1 here. So I'm showing the transferrin receptor 1 bound to Machupa virus GP1, and it's the, sub, the GP1 subunit is su perfectly sufficient for receptor binding. It doesn't require anything about the, the trimer. There's no conformational changes, and there's no receptor switch. So what does this mean for antibodies? Does receptor use dictate the kind of neutralizing antibodies elicited? If we look at the types of antibodies identified for new world arenaviruses, there's some against that post-fusion GP2 structure. There's many against the GP1, and we've never seen so far any that are directed against the pre-fusion trimer. If you look at whether or not these are neutralizing, no, none of the ones that bind the GP2 subunit are neutralizing. That's not surprising. And usually, if you have an antibody against GP1, it's very often neutralizing. And they, those antibodies do one thing. They only block receptor binding, at least as far as we've seen. And the story is different for Lhasa. There's many GP2 antibodies, many GP1 antibodies, and there's some against this post-fusion trimer. The only ones that are usually neutralizing are those against the post-fusion trimer. And those usually have one job, and that's to block conformational changes. So our goal in the lab was to identify protein engineering that never made those first two and always made the last one. And we did this by essentially brute force, where we made hundreds of plasmids and identified five mutations that did three things. One, we had to change the protease from S1P, which is uh, enormously inefficient, to furin. And then we bound the GP1 and the GP2 subunit together. We essentially stapled it with a disulfide bond and then introduced a proline mutation to prevent those conformational changes in GP2. And from here, we were able to garner this insight and identify where do those antibodies bind. Now, our first structure was with an antibody called 377H. This antibody is a human antibody from the largest competition group, which we call GBCB. And you can see that the antibody binds at the base of the trimer. It not only contacts one monomer, but in fact, it cross-links two monomers together, such that every single antibody contacts two GPs, and every GP is bound by two antibodies. This is exactly why you need that pre-fusion trimer for high affinity binding. It's a hugely quaternary epitope. If we look exactly at where this antibody binds and how it might work, we see that it, it basically contacts every single bit of GP2 that changes conformation upon, upon a low pH fusion. The fab locks every one of these components in place so that you can't get these rearrangements. Furthermore, it also blocks the transition from the pre-fusion state to the prime state. So you can use just a basic ELISA to look at the GP1 binding to LAMP1 alone, and in the presence of 377H, even though it doesn't bind anywhere near that one LAMP1 LAMP receptor site, we still get a blockage of this primed GP. So that was our first structure. We now have new structures. We have a structure of an antibody called 256A. This antibody is a somatic relative of 377H. It came from the same patient. And we also have a structure of an antibody called 185C. This is a more divergent antibody. It was isolated from uh, a patient in a different village. 
It has the same germline heavy chain, but a different light chain. Regardless, each one of these antibodies contacts GP in the same exact way. This major neutralizing epistope is essentially 100% conserved. And not only does it approach GP in the same way and contact the same components of GP, the CDRs are essentially identical in the paths they traced with GP. Now, so we have three antibodies that all anchor GP at the base of the trimer, and they all share the same epitope. They have very different neutralization potencies, however. 377H, that first one we solved, is our hot antibody. It has a relative potency of about one nanomole. Its somatic relative is eight times less potent. And 185C, that one that came from somebody else in a different village, is 15 times less potent. And this afforded us a really great opportunity to very discreetly dissect what makes a good antibody and what makes a poor antibody. What we noticed, there's a particular section in these antibodies that have what we call the triarginine patch, right? So the gray is the GP2 HR2 that goes down into the membrane. And the orange, uh, red, and blue are the CDRs. Now, 377H has two arginines in this region, and 256A has another two arginines, and they share one in common, whereas 185C has no arginines. We thought, could this really be the only reason why 185C is that poor antibody. So we went hunting, and we did this through virus neutralization assays. We, we start with 256A, that sort of moderately potent antibody, and we give it one arginine. Sure enough, you get to have four times more potent antibody. It's almost as good as 377H, and you can make it even better. So this is now in the uh, mid-hundreds of picomole uh, potency if you give it three arginines. You can do the same thing with 185C. You give it one arginine, you get better. You get two arginines, you get a little bit better, and you start combining those, and you can end up with an antibody that is 16 times more potent than that original parental antibody. And this antibody is now almost, if not a little bit better, than our hottest antibody. Now, all of this work was done with what we call lineage four. That's the one that's found in Western Africa. But there's more. Uh, lineages than just that one. There's three different ones found in Nigeria, one, two, and three, and then there's two others, uh, lineages five and six, found in Mali and the Ivory Coast and Togo and Benin. If you look at how well these antibodies perform against these particular lineages, you find that for lineages two through six, they do exactly what we would expect them to do. All right, but lineage one, which is found in a conflict region of Nigeria, is not so good. None of these antibodies work particularly well against this lineage. In fact, they leave a very, very large, unneutralized fraction. So our goal was to try to identify whether or not any of our improved antibodies had any effect on this particular lineage. And we saw no decrease in the unneutralized fraction with our hottest antibodies, even if we made them better. However, if we looked at 185C, it has the worst total neutralization but the addition of a single arginine, suddenly we're approaching 85% neutralization. If you get of a different arginine, you get 95. And if you combine those two, not only do you achieve 100% neutralization, you do so with low nanomolar or affinity now. And this has all been done in a VSV background, but we can also do this in a BSL-4 format with authentic loss of virus and the C, the same thing. We can start out with cold parental virus uh, antibodies and we can now neutralize 100% of these viruses with our newly re-engineered hot antibody. So one of the major driving forces of our lab is to use fundamental structural biology and biochemistry to affect better biological activity. And we do this to be able to bring it back into these molecules and back into the virus. And in doing so, we create a, a system of a positive feedback where our molecules that represent these key structures with very high fidelity can be used in the field. We can leverage our long-term relationships with these survivors and these healthcare workers. These relationships allow us to find those very rare individuals whose immune systems have already naturally beat these diseases. 
With our new technology, we have a, a Titan Halos now, CryoEM, we can image these antibodies bound to their targets the day after, they, them, the day after we express them. No longer will these structures take us 10 years to accomplish. We can look at these antibodies in combinations and identify populations of antibodies within the human serum. We're now working with Berkeley Lights and their beacon system to identify these needle in a haystack antibodies that we isolate from these elderly populations that have been multiply exposed over a lifetime that have really unique immune responses. It is our goal and our mission, we are on a campaign to make the sun set on these infectious diseases. If you are interested in being a part of that, we are now hiring B cell specialists. Please contact Erica. This is our group here. I want to particularly point out Erica there in the middle. We're all sitting in uh, packing crate 32 of 32 of our EM. Uh, Michelle Zandanati and Emily Harkins were instrumental uh, technicians in this work. And in, as I mentioned, summer 2019, you can find us at La Jolla Institute uh, for Immunology, just two miles down the road from where Scripps is now. So with thanks, there's many uh, more folks that have been involved in this project over this 10 years. I just wanted in particular to recognize those at TSRI and soon to be LJI, Bob Gary and James Robinson at Tulane University, folks at Zalgin Labs, uh, those especially at the Kenema Government Hospital. None of this is possible without the support of the local people that we have these relationships with. And of course, those that work on the uh, BSL-4 agents with us at UTMB. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I will take any questions. Thank you.